very neat looking farmhouse um, right gently on the door and the farm owner answers it and uh, the guy says, uh, please, could you give me something to eat? I really haven't had a good meal in several days. And uh, the, the farm owner says, well, no, I, I've made quite a lot of money um, in my lifetime by supplying goods and food to people, but I've never given anything away for free. Uh, he said, but, you know, you know, I understand you haven't had much to eat. He said, I'll tell you what, round the back you'll see this tin of paint, there's a clean tea, uh, toothbrush, toothbrush, paintbrush, uh, and uh, if you paint my porch, in, uh, around the back of the house, then I'll give you a really good meal. So uh, the guy goes off around the back, and sometime later there's a knock on the door again, and the owner says, oh, you finished already? He said, yeah, I've done it all as you are. So I'll oh, come and sit down, the cook will bring you in a lovely meal. And uh, he said, that's great, thank you very much. By the way, he said, there's something you ought to know. Uh, that's not a Porsche you've got around the back, that's a BMW. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was looking at this passage uh, again this, this week and uh, we are using uh, Matthew's Gospel in particular to work through kind of this late time and uh, I hope you will read and reread and reread again this passage uh, again use different versions of the Bible uh, if you will if it kind of gives you a different angle on the storyline. Uh, and I mean, the one phrase that stood out for me this past week was the words from Governor Hyde. Uh, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? But we start in this particular reading, uh, kind of almost where we left off last week, and that is with Judas. Last Sunday evening we had a real big study together and some of the discussion centred around Judas and uh, of course Judas gets a lot of bad press um, and for all that we do know about Judas, what he said what he did uh, leading up to crucifixion, there is actually a whole lot of stuff that we don't know about him like his motives uh, like how he fits into God's eternal plan uh, but of course his name is linked forever with the betraying of the Son of God. And uh, I kind of thought for a moment about that name. I, I, I looked up online baby names. And I thought, I wonder how many people use the name of Judas. Mm. Uh, so I, I looked up and, and the, the best selection I could find, you may find different figures online just is neglected and statistics tell you what you want to tell them, I suppose. Uh, but I looked up the America, baby names. Big country, lots of babies, so uh, you think you get a good indication of baby names there and so on. Uh, the baby names registered go back a long while, 100 years. And uh, Judas, nothing, 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 nothing. For years and years, there was no Judas at all. And when we get to the rebellious 1960s, <laughs> There were a few given the name of Judas. 1969, five babies in America were given the name Judas. Perhaps their mums all hadn't read the Bible enough. Or something. And then again, there was bits of gaps and so on. By 2001, he had to reach double figures. The number of people who were called Judas in America. Last year, it reached 21 babies. But, you know, you kind of think the millions of babies. Uh, such is the stigma given to that name that hardly anyone still gives that name to their baby. Uh, you might remember uh, somewhere in the back of your mind that Jesus' younger brother had the name of Judas. Um, but when he wrote that letter that we believe he wrote in the Bible, in the New Testament. Uh, he doesn't put the name Judas. What does he put them? Jude. 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 Yes, Jude. He's done a short bit just to kind of clarify things. Can't blame him really, can you? Uh, anyway, we had a big debate at the site last 
Sunday as to whether Jesus is in heaven or not. Um, you know the answer we came to? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. Um, and that is true pretty much of every person who is there. Um, it's not in our calling. We are not here to judge someone whether they get into heaven or not, or try and discern whether they're in heaven or not. It's not our call. Uh, our task is proclaiming the good news to people. And uh, we need to do a bit of a self-examination. It's always good to do a self-examination. Uh, even biblically it says you need to examine yourself from time to time. And kind of ask yourself if we sometimes uh, are critical or judgmental of those um, people kind of say, oh well, you know, they're not Christian, yeah, they're terrible people, or whatever. Uh, are we judging them and criticizing them rather than sharing the good news with them? You know, when we when we get into our prayer life, are we praying for people that we kind of think, well, you know, at the moment it doesn't seem like they're going towards heaven. But I need to pray and do something to make sure they do. You know, kind of put that positive side on it. Because, you know, only the only people that Jesus, when I was thinking about this during the week, the only people that Jesus seemed to really judge was those in authority. And he had a few harsh words for them. But in general, everyone else, he showed grace to. Them. Even, you know, women caught in adultery in that, still showed grace to. Them. Um, and, in fact, there's a lovely line from Jesus in Luke 6, 37. Uh, which really points this out. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Um, we are told in uh, this passage that with Judas uh, he was seized with remorse and uh, in verse 4 he seems to kind of confess that he has sinned now I'm not making any statement about that I'm just pointing out uh, some of the things about Judas we don't know some would say that he took his own life uh, and some would see that as an unforgivable sin I don't actually find that myself no. Uh, six people in the Old Testament, including King Saul, took their own life. No one seems to have really condemned him either. I do love the words that I found this past week um, of a guy called Lewis B. Smeads, who wrote in Christianity Today on this whole subject, because I was kind of going through it all again from last Sunday evening. And he says this, I believe that as Christians, we should worry less about whether Christians who have killed themselves go to heaven and worry more about how we can help people like them to find help and, sorry, hope and joy in living. Again, it's not the negative. We need to find a positive way of encouraging people who are, you know, in depression and so on to, to come out of it and to help them through things. Um, so, anyway, moving on because we've covered quite a bit about Judas in the last couple of weeks. Um, so the question asked by Governor Pilate in verse 22, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? What shall I do with him? Um, that question has been on my mind all week. It's a personal question. What shall I do with this Jesus called the Christ? Uh, and it's interesting to see how Pilate kind of tried to deal with this issue of what he should do with Jesus. Um, it seems in some ways that Pilate tried to kind of push off making a decision. Uh, he wanted someone else to make the decision. In, in John's Gospel, chapter 18 and verse 31, it says, Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Don't bring him to me. I don't want him here and I have to make a decision. You, you 
Take it to somebody else. Mm. It's kind of, what do I do with Jesus? Well, I'll go with whatever anybody else says. I'll just kind of go with the crowd. You know, if someone else deals with it, that's fine. And I wonder if our faith in Jesus Christ sometimes stands when we're not around Christians. Um, Paul talks in Ephesians 4 about immature believers being tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Could that be said apart in this particular situation? What shall I do with Jesus? I'll listen to others, I'll pass them on to others, I'll go with the flow. I wonder if it's said of us. a little bit with the wind of whatever is happening around us at the time. Pilate, Pilate wanted the crowd to make a decision in verse 15. Do you want Jesus Barabbas? Shared the same name. Interesting, Barabbas means son of the father. Some said, did the crowd get Or do you want Jesus called the King of the Jews? Over to the crowd. Over to you. You decide. I don't want to decide. Uh, and you might not think that we go with the crowd. You might think, I mean, I'm bent strong in my faith and, and so on. Um, but if you sometimes catch yourself and think about it, I wonder how often we do actually go to the crowd. You know, we kind of go, oh, yeah, that, that's what I thought. Or we find ourselves nodding our head to someone else's comments. And, even when we know they're wrong. Just to kind of keep in with the crowd that we're sitting and standing with. Pilate wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Verse 24, we know that washing of the hand ritual which even today we kind of say, I'm washing my hands of it. That's what Pilate tried to do. I'm going to you know, try and forget this. It's not my call. I'm going to wash my hands of a decision. Um, of course his hands weren't clean. This morning, you also might be a little bit like that. What shall I do with Jesus? Someone give me an answer. I'll go with what other people say in the church. I'll go with, go with what the, the preacher says at the front. I'll go with what was said in the Bible study. I'll go with what this famous speaker said somewhere that I heard, read, listened to, whatever. That's what I'll do with Jesus. I'll, I'll go with somebody else. Not my head at them. Or I'll just kind of blend in with the crowd. And when I'm out of the church and I'm with some friends or mates, if they kind of you know, say something or laugh or something, I'll just act along with them. You might even say, I don't want anything to do with him. It's my life. I'll run it. Yeah, I read the Bible, I'll go to church. But I don't want this king ruling me. Because I won't still take control of my life. But you know, it's a decision you've got to make. What will you do with Jesus? It's a question that really demands an action. Some of us have already made that decision. Yeah, I believe that Jesus is my Lord. He died for me. He is the way to heaven. Uh, I'm going to follow him 24-7. He's going to be my leader. I'm going to have a lasting relationship with him, which means that I'm going to share with him, and he's going to share with me, and so on. And, and that's your goal in life. 
But for the rest of us this morning, I wonder what we're deciding. Because we're confronted with a decision to make. And it's either, it's only one of two choices. There's no sitting on fences. There's no kind of hovering around for a few months, a few years, a lifetime. We need to make a decision. Will you either receive Christ or will you reject him? That is the choice. Not in between. Will you obey Christ or will you disobey him? Will you confess Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord or will you deny him? It's a really important decision to make and one that we are confronted with and have to make a choice over. We can't kind of stand as Pilate did and uh, say even he tried to wash his hands or move away or not make a decision, but in the end he had to make a decision as we do. And we need to take this decision seriously because it is an eternally important decision. No other, import, no other decision is as important as this one. What will you do with Jesus? You know, some try to defer. I've heard all sorts of people come saying, why don't I lead a good life? I hope that's going to be okay. I do what I can. I was brought up as a Christian, so uh, I'm obviously trapped in the right path somewhere. Or well, I believe in God. And all of them are kind of washy statements which really are kind of saying, well, I haven't actually accepted Christ as Savior and Lord. But this is a decision about Jesus Christ. It's not about whether you eat dinner or not, or you go out or not, or even what job you choose. It's not about some religious ceremony, about rules or regulations, about doing good deeds. What will you do with this person, Jesus Christ? You know, in the story there were these two prisoners, basically. There was Jesus, Son of God, and there was Jesus Barabbas, Jesus, Son of the Father. A murderer or an innocent man. And in the storyline of Philippus, the sinner is the one who is released. And God's son is the one who is put on the cross. I wonder, do you see yourselves as Barabbas? You know, we might not be a murderer. But the Bible says, of course, we have all sinned, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And certainly none of us, none of us, not one here this morning, deserves to be in heaven for all of eternity. Not one of us discerns that freedom in Christ. But here in this Easter story is an actual event of God's Son going through hell instead of you and me. And God puts this kind of fantastic visual aid, if you like, in the storyline. When Jesus is before Pilate. Because Jesus takes the place of a known sin. And this morning, we are all known sin. Everyone. Lead us in prayer. And if the word 
they only reconfirm it. Today is the day that I honestly answer that question, what shall I do with the future? And I'm going to make that decision before you all. Jesus Christ, today I say, you are my God. I know I am the sinner, and you are the Savior. I am the clay, you are the potter. I am your servant, and you are my master. You are the way, and I am following you all the days of my life. Amen. Fill my life. 